Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wa salam wa rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. So I think this is the longest time that I've been away from Seattle for a very, very long time, for several years, alhamdulillah. Uh, I know that it's been almost two years since I've had a chance to be at this community. So it's wonderful to see, alhamdulillah, the incredible progress that the community has made. Um, we sent Ustad Adam from uh, Dallas, so you're welcome. And I also want to thank uh, the, the community here for hosting us today, alhamdulillah, for this program. The last time I came, does anyone remember what I taught? What was it? You can't just nod your head and not answer. The life of who? Salman al-Farisi radiallahu ta'ala anhu and his pursuit of the truth and everything that he was willing to undertake in order to arrive at the truth and then how he embodied that truth and became a torch, a light for the entire world amongst the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if I do get the chance to come back, I'll, I'll teach inshaAllah Ta'ala on the, the life of Al-Hajj Malik al-Shabazz, Malcolm X Rahimullah Ta'ala, who faced in the last year of his life in particular, the consequences of embodying the truth that he found and that is a personal favorite uh, for me to teach out of all the seminars I've taught in the past about his life. And I want you to just appreciate inshallah ta'ala that what's happening throughout the day is this is building frames. It's giving you a perspective on how to approach the world. This is part of, of shaping our worldview. Now the first two topics were a lot heavier than the topic that I have heavier in the sense of substance and in the content. What I'm going to be speaking about, it puts you back on the side of delivery, the one who's actually giving the message. So it actually puts you on the side of the delivery of that content, the delivery of that da'wah. And it's this term that we coin compassionate orthodoxy. And obviously those things are important both in the side of compassion and in the content in regards to the orthodoxy. Compassionate refers to the, the delivery. Orthodoxy refers to the message retaining its purest form. And many times, under the illusion that the only way to make someone accept a message is to alter it, and that is in fact compassion, we do not do a service to that person, and in the process, we also lose the message itself. So I actually put together some slides too, and I usually never do this, but just because I had to be on par with Dr. Nazar, Sister Tasneem, uh, I put together some slides as well, inshallah ta'ala, about how do we arrive at a compassionate orthodoxy? How do we deliver the message properly? And this is something that's always going to be subject to de debate. And I want you to appreciate that the diversity that existed in Islamic law and among scholars was also because of the different ways in which they viewed the world and the different approaches that they had at trying to arrive at the same conclusion. The goal was to preserve the deen. The goal was to make the deen as pragmatic as possible, as practicable as possible, without compromising the foundations of the deen. And it was always a sensitive discussion as to how to gauge where people are at, what they are ready to accept, and how the message should be packaged and delivered to them. Now here's the thing, all of them were acting upon usul, they were acting upon a great uh, sense of, of, of care when it came to methodology and how they arrived at their approaches, not just how they arrived at their opinions, but how they arrived at their approaches. And most of the time in our situation when it comes to delivery, uh, we, we're not acting upon a methodology, we're acting upon our own personal experiences, and sometimes we do great damage to the deen because we don't deliver it properly. So for example, if you de deliver orthodoxy but without compassion, you actually run someone away from the orthodoxy, you run someone away, away from the message. When the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna minkum There are those amongst you who turn people off from the deen. You run people away from the deen. He was speaking to a companion, Mus'ab ibn Umair, I'm sorry, Mu'adh ibn Jabal because Mu'adh 
was reading long surahs in Salatul Isha and that became difficult for the people and the Prophet ﷺ said, amongst you are people that run people away from the deen. All he was doing was reciting Quran. But you need to gauge where the people are at. And when the man came to Mu'ad and told Mu'ad that uh, you read too much Quran and you need to shorten the surahs and he complained to the Prophet ﷺ, Mu'ad's natural response was, he's a munafiq, he's a hypocrite. Now, by the way, no one loves the Qur'an more than the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ is a man who would read Al-Baqarah, Ali Imran, and Nisa in one rak'ah. Make your feet bleed because of how much he read Qur'an. There isn't really much for him to relate to a person who thinks that reading Surah Al-Qiyamah is like Yawm Al-Qiyamah and Salat Al-Isha. Like it's too long. That's not something that the Prophet ﷺ can relate to from an experience. But the Prophet ﷺ put the onus on Mu'adh and told Mu'adh to read shorter surahs and said, there are those amongst you that turn people off from the deen. You run people away, you deflate people. That's with the Qur'an. So if the purest form of da'wah is to recite the Qur'an, there, is no, there isn't even a tafsir of the Qur'an there or an interpretation or anything that's being added on to it. And even in that situation, you can turn someone off from the deen if you don't do it properly. Then what does that mean with secondary material? And our approaches, when there has been such a distance between us and the physical presence of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ on this earth, it means we need to be extra careful. Now cherry picking exists not just with opinions. It exists with the way that we read the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ too. We read the biography of the Prophet ﷺ and craft entire methodologies out of. Let me give you this example. Or let me explain this to you in, in, in common uh, discourse and debate. If you are looking for leniency from the Prophet ﷺ seerah, you will find it. If you want to craft a narrative, for example, about engagement, how we should engage with our enemies, you can misapply the Prophet ﷺ's engagement in a principled way and justify unprincipled engagement by focusing on the fact that the Prophet ﷺ engaged his enemies. We all know that the Prophet ﷺ engaged his enemies, but there are parameters and you could take advantage of the people upon whom the nuances will be lost and craft an entire narrative. You can use Hudaybiyah to justify every type of engagement that you have. If that's what you're trying to do. And find all the examples and create a narrative out of that. But you wouldn't be true to the wholesome seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. On the other hand, if you're looking for a fight, if you're looking for a battle, if you're looking for a time when a little bit of, 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 of harshness or, or you know, uh, a more assertive or aggressive reaction was undertaken, you can find that in the Prophet ﷺ's too. And you could turn that into an entire narrative like we got to stand up to the enemies and we got to put them in their place. And you could do damage and depart so far away from the prophetic methodology while only quoting prophetic sources. كَلِمَةُ حَقٍ رِيدُ بِهِ بَاطٍ the Prophet uh, Ali radiallahu anhu mentioned that sometimes a word of truth could be spoken. Uridu biha batirin and what's sought is falsehood. So it's a word of truth that's spoken. What's, what's behind it though is falsehood. Okay? I got asked this question, I was in uh, DC two days ago. What's wrong with all lives matter? I said, Kalimatu haqqin. Uridu biha batir. There's nothing wrong with the motto or with the, with, the, with the words at face value, but it's what's behind what's being said that's problematic. So when people quoted Qur'an and Ali radiallahu anhu and said, in al hukmu illa lillah, that verily power and authority only belongs to Allah. Kalimatu haqqin. It's not that you're saying anything wrong, it's what you intend by it and the narrative that you're creating based upon it that is falsehood. So if someone wants to be a little bit aggressive, they take a few incidents and they color the entire seerah of the Prophet ﷺ that way and they justify their harshness with that. So the first thing is this, when you read the surah, when you read the seerah or the surah, when you read the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, understanding the default versus the exception. The default. When the Prophet ﷺ says, Inna Allah yuhibbu rifq fil amri kulli. 
that Allah loves gentleness and leniency in all things. That's the default. You will not hear the Prophet ﷺ say, Allah loves severity in all things. Even though sometimes the Prophet ﷺ implemented a more severe measure. But the nature, the default, that which should only be departed from in justifiable circumstances, to arrive at the same goal that is sought with the leniency, is the exception. Not the norm, not the default. So to take a few incidents and then to cast the Prophet ﷺ in that light and to turn the Prophet ﷺ into someone who's condescending, harsh, prideful, which is a disease that religious people often fall into, is deeply problematic. You take the asr, you take the default. And the only time the Prophet ﷺ departed from the default is when he needed to do so to arrive at what was sought by the default. So the Prophet ﷺ did not depart from gentleness because someone was really a jerk. Or someone really, really got on his nerves that time. Or someone really, really, did, you know, uh, their tongue was that bad. The Prophet ﷺ showed gentleness, rifq, as a norm in his da'wah because that is usually the best way to get someone to change something that they're doing in a way that empowers them. Brings them to a place where they feel empowered to make a change in their lives. To be willing to reassess their own worldviews and conclusions. To be willing to add on to themselves an inconvenience for a higher purpose. Usually gentleness is what's needed. The Prophet ﷺ taught us to put our ego aside and to think in that way. If he departed from that gentleness, it was because that person needed a departure from that gentleness for their own good in order to arrive at that same place the Prophet ﷺ was seeking. But the default stays what? Inna Allah yuhibbu rifq fil amri kulli. Allah loves gentleness in all of his affairs. So in all of our affairs, Gentleness should be the norm. It should be the default. It should be the starting place. It should not be a 50-50. And you can't even say an 80-20. It's the norm and you only depart from it when there is good reason to do so for the good of the person that you're doing da'wah to, for the good of the person that you're calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second thing is that the Prophet ﷺ is described وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ You are upon an exalted standard of character. He's described as rahmatan lil alameen, a mercy to the world. Allah describes the Prophet ﷺ by his defining traits, not by exceptional circumstances. And a dishonest reader of the seerah negates those noble traits by taking exceptions and turning them into traits. Taking situational behavior and turning it into normative behavior and assigning that to the Messenger ﷺ and in the process runs people away from Allah and runs people away from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well. Now, removal of the nafs, removal of the ego from the conversation. Typically in an argument, the first thing that's lost is the thing that you were arguing about in the first place. Right, if there's an argument that takes place or a debate, it usually quickly moves on from the subject of the argument and the subject of the debate into the spokespeople of the argument and the spokespeople of the debate. And it becomes very highly charged with our nufus, with ourselves. The way that I want us to look at this is actually starting off with ourselves. The Prophet ﷺ taught us, no one of you believes until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. Many ways, or in many situations, the Prophet ﷺ taught us to treat people the way that we want to be treated. Right? Approach people the way that you want to be approached. And so the very first thing that you should consider in calling someone to Allah or in doing da'wah or presenting something that might be difficult to bear for them, is how would this be approached with me in an ideal situation? How would I want to be spoken to about this? What are the considerations that I would have? And this is where you start from. Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah, he said that the veil between a servant and Allah is his nafs. 
is his self. That is the hijab between a servant and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bringing that veil down requires you on an individual level to undertake actions that will remove the nafs so that you can fully be in contact with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you're talking to someone, the last thing that you want to do is create a situation, create a scenario in which you have instigated or agitated their nafs so that they can't hear anything about Allah when you're speaking to them. Generally speaking, no one likes to be told that they're wrong, right? None of us like that. None of us like to be on the side of falsehood in a debate between truth and falsehood. None of us like to be called in or called out. It's just particularly, particularly aggressive when it's called out. But people in general don't like to be on the receiving end of advice. They don't like to be wrong. And what the Prophet ﷺ teaches us to do is to take actions when you're talking to someone, whether that's your child or someone in the street, that would ensure as much as pops possible the removal of the nafs from the equation. My goal is not to win the arguments. My goal is to win the heart. My goal is not to prove that I am right. My goal is that the person in the wrong comes to the conclusion that they can be right. You see the difference between these things? So when you're talking to someone, the removal of anything that would agitate their nafs as much as possible to make the message as capable or as potent as possible of reaching the heart is the goal. Whatever I can do to ease that veil out of the way so that my heart can reach yours. And then it comes to the heart-to-heart -heart conversation. But you can't have the heart-to-heart -heart conversation with the nafs in the way. Because what disconnects the heart from Allah is what disconnects people from each other too. Right? Pride disconnects us from Allah and it disconnects us from each other as well. So you want to remove the veil from the heart. And then, لا ينفع القلب إلا ما خرج من القلب. As Al-Qadi Iyad rahimahullah said, nothing benefits the heart unless it comes from the heart. Then you can have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. It's very interesting is that if you think about the shaitan, Iblis, Iblis had absolutely no confusion whatsoever over the truth. It was his pride that led him to a place of rejection. And so it's not always about the content of the message. Sometimes it's about the implications. Sometimes it's about the perceived degradation. And there is a level of humbling yourself that's necessary to come into the fold of full Islam, the fullness of Islam, right? But that degradation should not be to another human being. So I'll degrade, I'll humble myself to Allah, but if do I have to degrade myself to you, right? There is a difference between those two things. The third thing here is that qualifiers are not a sign of weakness. Qualifiers are not a sign of weakness. The prophets used qualifiers when they spoke to their people. The prophets tried to reach their people by, if you will, softening the blow. <laughs> All right? So there's this idea that if you speak too nicely, then you're automatically speaking dishonestly. If you speak too courteously, then you're automatically speaking connivingly. So if you use so many qualifiers and, and so many different things before you get to the message and employ those tactics, that means you're afraid. That means that you're scared. That means you're a coward. Whereas in reality, you're actually interested in the rise of the truth, not you as the rise of the spokesperson for the truth. You actually want to remove your voice as much as possible because God forbid that in the process of trying to call someone else to overcome their nafs, you grow your own nafs. <laughs> that defeats the entire purpose of da'wah. That it no longer is calling to Allah, it's calling to yourself. It's no longer calling people to hear the Qur'an, it's calling them to hear your voice. It's no longer getting people to prostrate to Allah, it's getting them to bow to you. 
That's where it becomes deception for ourselves as well, being in the capacity of giving da'wah. So actually using as much hikmah as possible, as much wisdom as possible, being as gentle as possible, softening the blow, being as courteous. In fact, humbling yourself to the person as you call them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that they don't perceive that this is just you trying to take advantage of a situation as opposed to calling them to Allah. All of that is from the tradition of the prophets and it's in the interest of the preservation of the truth. It's not out of fear, it's not out of cowardice, it's out of a love for the truth and the willingness to even humble yourself in the pursuit of that truth, not just for you, but it being manifested in the heart and the tongue and in the ears of the person that you're speaking to as well. So body language is important. If you look at the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, it's actually profound how much emotional intelligence the Prophet ﷺ had, how much of an awareness of his environment he had وسلم, how much he paid attention to detail when speaking to or being spoken to. So a person could be speaking to the Prophet وسلم, and they could be spewing the most incredulous nonsense ever and he'd sit there and he'd let them finish وسلم. When the Kuffar of Quraysh addressed the Messenger والسلام, as aggressive as they addressed him and they poked and poked and poked and poked and they spoke and spoke and spoke and spoke he let them finish Go ahead and get it all out because this shouldn't become a shouting match you know, and the Prophet Sallallahu understood that when someone is in the midst of speaking, even if they have not completed their sentence, if their thoughts are still incomplete, then they're not going to be able to hear the thoughts that you're sharing with them. So he let them finish. Get it all out. Say everything that you have to say. That was his attitude Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whether it was from someone who was a disbeliever and aggressive, or it was from someone who was a believer and you know, a friend to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi a companion to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam employed a remarkable level of consistency. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam always giving you his ear. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam not pointing at you. Can you imagine? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam paid such attention to body language, he wouldn't point at you. He used his entire hand Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so that you didn't feel antagonized even by his finger and this finger. He didn't feel hurt by it. You don't feel like he's pointing you out. See, I'm pointing at you guys as I'm trying to explain it. You don't feel like he's pointing you out. See, we all have a long way to go until we reach the sunnah of the Messenger Wasallam. He used as much as he could to show the person that he was being considerate of them. He faced you with his entire body. The Prophet Wasallam did not walk past people like this. He gave you his entire attention. The Prophet Wasallam did not degrade the person that came to him. You know, one of my fav favorite hadith is the hadith of Limab ibn Tha'laba. It's a rough Bedouin, walks into the masjid. He was so coarse and so harsh in his voice and that the Sahaba said that he was addressing the Prophet Sallallahu and the Prophet Sallallahu was sitting down. They said, we gathered after some time that he was asking him about Islam because his, his, his accent was all off, the words were so rough and the Prophet Sallallahu did not degrade or belittle him or make that person feel like they were out of place or that they were less deserving of the attention of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So giving you his entire body language. I'm not going to go through the methodology here in regards to body language, but just basic considerations and courtesies, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam showed those in the midst of conversation so that he gave you the feeling of importance. And that's really what it boils down to. Body language often conveys the value that you're assigning to that interaction. So the Messenger وسلم, giving you the fullness of his attention, the fullness of his attention con con conveyed through his body language allowed for you to be receptive to what he was going to say to you وسلم, because you understood that he was not failing to take you seriously. Right? The Prophet وسلم, was taking you seriously, he was taking your concerns seriously, he was listening to your arguments, whatever they were, he was considering what you were saying وسلم, no matter what it was that you were saying. In orthodoxy as well, when it comes to the, the concept of graduality, تدرج in da'wah, graduality in da'wah, 
a lot of people would also scorn at that thought that, or scoff at that thought that how can you be gradual with the truth? The truth is there, it's manifest. The truth is here, falsehood has gone. So what's the point of being gradual? Understand that the goal of conveying the message, whether it's to a child or to a friend or to someone who's a foe, the goal is to remove the person from the sin. Anything that would do the opposite of that is sinful itself. So the purpose of graduality is to give them the ability to be able to comprehend it. You know, subhanAllah, one of the, one of the examples that one of my teachers gave, a very basic example, when we talk about al water, Allah often refers to uh, divine guidance or speaks about it in the context of water. Sharia means a path that leads to water, right? So water is often the metaphorical counterpart of guidance, right? It's analogous to guidance. Can you hurt someone with water? Yes, you can. You can drown them with water. They could drink too much water at a time. It's very hard to do that if the water is pure. But still, at the same time, even with water, it could do more harm than good if it's not applied uh, properly. And this is an example that we find from the Prophet ﷺ when it comes to uh, one of the tribes that the Prophet ﷺ dealt with. Um, and this is a narration in Sahih al-Bukhari with Banu Hanifa that these people... They told they were the last people to accept Islam. The last people to accept Islam as a tribe. And they basically kept on putting these conditions on the Prophet. It's a pretty remarkable hadith. We'll probably write a paper for it on Yaqeen one day, an article that draws out the entire sharh of the hadith. The point being, anything the Prophet told them, they came back with a compromise. So the Prophet tells them to pray five times a day. They say that's too much. We'll pray once a day. Okay, fine. Maybe three times a day. It's like, this isn't Musa and Asra al-Mi'raj anymore. The deen is complete. It's five times a day. Prophet Sallallahu tells him about fasting. No, no, no. We, we can't do all that fasting. Once a week, twice a week. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu is there and he's watching this interaction with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and them. And Umar radiallahu anhu is steaming. How is it that these people have the nerve after all these years of rejecting the Prophet Sallallahu and they're trying to make compromises? And the Prophet Sallallahu told Umar radiallahu anhu, look, they will, they will end up praying and they will end up fasting. They're going to end up doing all the things that you're afraid of them not doing. Because the Prophet Sallallahu did not change the hukum of it. He didn't change the rulings. The Prophet ﷺ told them, you know what, start with that, move on. Start with that, you'll get there. What happened is that once they started praying three times a day, it was like, okay, now we're going to pray five times a day. It was a natural growth for them. So I always remember a brother that came to me and, and you know, he would come to the masjid and all types of things. He didn't take shahada and it was two years later. And I said, why haven't you taken shahada? I'm just curious. He said, can't give up my pork. The man loved his pork sandwiches so much. Well, by the way, I'm not even making it up, and it was two full years. Every time I mention it, I think of his face when I, when, when I told him, just become Muslim and give up your pork in time, inshallah. All right, so he t it's better if you take your shahada and go eat your pork sandwich, knowing that it's haram to eat, than avoiding shahada because you love your pork sandwich. Alhamdulillah, he eventually gave up the pork too. I think, alhamdulillah. <laughs> he did it at least the last time I checked up on him. I haven't spoken to him in years. But in time, the pork went out the window too. So the Prophet ﷺ understood that. Look, the standard's not being adjusted. That's where this becomes dangerous. When the orthodoxy itself is compromised for the sake of suiting this individual person's weakness or this group's weakness. That's when this becomes problematic. Otherwise, let them grow into it. Encourage them to grow into it. And we find this subhanAllah with Umar ibn Abdul Aziz rahimahullah. When Umar ibn Abdul Aziz is a very powerful narration that when he assumed the Khilafah, the Caliphate, and there was so much corruption that had been done, and Umar ibn Abdul Aziz raised a son that was so religious, so pious, and Abdul Malik ibn Umar, that he would, uh, you know, Umar radiallahu anhu uh, said that he would, he would, you know, he would push me to Allah, that he was 
This was a, a young man that Omar empowered to a point that he'd give his father a nasiha. He would remind him of Allah. He would push him. And so as Umar ibn Abdul Aziz is spending day and night trying to rectify all the corruption and all that's been done in the ummah, his son points out a new bid'ah, a new form of corruption, a new this, a new that. And Umar ibn Abdul Aziz said, Oh my son, I don't want to bring them all or force them upon Islam all at one time because then they will leave Islam all at one time. I don't want to force it all on them at one time because then they will ditch it all at one time. At the first opportunity that they get, they would feel so overburdened, so hurt by it that they would ditch it all at one time. The minute that the force that put the Islam on them is removed, so too will Islam be removed from them. Because Islam would have only been experienced by them as a prescribed burden, not as an attained gift. So Umar ibn Abdul Aziz said, I'm not going to do that. Even though Umar made, and I know the word radical is usually bad, especially when it's used in a masjid or when it's used in anything Islam or Muslim. But Umar radiallahu anhu really brought in radical change in so many different ways. But even then he was exercising some caution and not doing everything all at one time because he wanted the people to grow into that. So while he was passing his reforms, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, bringing the people back upon the sunnah, he did not do it in a way that made the people hate the sunnah. He led by example, he set the standard, and he let people grow into it. So the standard is what cannot change no matter what, no matter how weak someone is or how, how someone is feeling. The best thing to do is to take the ayah from the Qur'an, Ud'u ila sabili rabbik, call to the way of your Lord, with two things. Al-hikmah, wisdom, and what's the second one? Al-maw'idha al-hasana. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, call to the way of your, that says half time, right? Okay. Call to the way of your Lord with wisdom, and then with good, beautiful preaching. If you break this down, the first thing that you see is call to the way of your Lord, meaning there should be no ambiguity about what the way of your Lord actually is at any point in your da'wah. There should never be any compromise on what the message itself actually is. So call to the way of your Lord. Ala bayina, ala basira with absolute evidence, with proofs, with full clarity about what it is. But Allah Azza wa Jal emphasizes afterwards the methodology with which you call. Allah does not even use the word ilm. Funny enough, Allah doesn't use the word knowledge. Allah uses the word hikmah, wisdom. Hikmah comes from the, the origin of it is the horse's reins. Think about a crazy horse, al-hakamah. The, a crazy horse, a horse that doesn't have its reins to keep it in control and how wild it goes. Hikmah governs knowledge. It governs that ilm. It makes sure that you apply it with wisdom, that you teach it with wisdom. Otherwise, it's like unleashing a wild beast on people. You do more harm than good. You do a disservice. So bil hikmah, wisdom. Most of wisdom, Al-Iz ibn Abd salam rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, most of wisdom is in the proportion. That's given. So it's obviously uh, when it comes to the, the you know the the the, uh, the words that you choose, being very aware of the words that you choose, and many of the things that we already mentioned about the Prophet Sallallahu Yes, even when speaking to a child, even when speaking to someone that's very close to you, being very conscious of those things that could make or break your da'wah. Still, what it really comes down to is also proportion. Right, speaking to them with doses that they can handle in ways that not just they can handle, in ways they'll actually appreciate. In ways that they'll actually appreciate. You know, I, I once heard one of the mashayikh, he said, there's, you know, sometimes people make this binary choice between give people what they need and give people what they want, right? So he said the, the, the middle ground is give people what they need in a way that they want. <laughs> That's bil hikmah and maw'id al hasana. Give people what they need in a way that they want. So you give it to people. One, that's possible. Obviously, sometimes that's not possible. But as much as you can, right? So proportional and with graduality, bil hikmah. Allah emphasized hikmah. And then Allah emphasized with beautiful preaching. 
Mawida is heart to heart. Hasana speaks to the care, the goodness that you use as you're delivering that. So the mawida is the substance. The hasana once again emphasizes the care that you use as you're delivering that message from heart to heart. Let it not be mind to mind, tongue to tongue. Let it be a heart to heart conversation. Something that usually cannot be achieved through the internet, by the way. Can't be achieved through writing. It requires a sit down. It requires a relationship that's built it requires some level of trust that is built before you can speak to someone in that way and really challenge them. And the last thing that I want to do here is an exercise. The example of Ibrahim السلام, in Surah Maryam. It's a fantastic example because Allah actually shows how all of these things are incorporated in the da'wah of Ibrahim السلام. When Ibrahim السلام, إِذْ قَالَ لِأَبِيهِ يَا أَبَتِ لِمَا تَعْبُدُ مَا لَا يَسْمَعُ وَلَا يُبْصِرُ وَلَا يُغْنِي عَنْكَ شَيْئًا Oh my father, oh my dear father, ya abati, he speaks to him in the most honorable way, not O oh kafir, not you horrible human being, not you idol maker, he wasn't even an idol worshiper, you idol maker, no, ya abati, you have not ceased to be my father and you are my beloved and dear father. Ya abati, in the most endearing term. Lima ta'budu ma la yasma'u wa la yubsiru wa la yughni anka shay'a. Why do you worship that which doesn't hear, that which doesn't see, that which does you absolutely no good? Focusing it all on the object of his worship. This isn't about me. Just think about what good do these gods bring to you in the first place? What are you gaining out of worshiping these gods. Then he says to him, Ya abati, inni qad ja'ani min al-ilmi ma lam ya'tika fattabi'ni ahdika siratan sawiyya. Oh my father, my dear father, inni qad ja'ani min al-ilmi ma lam ya'tika. You talk about qualifiers, there are possibly no more qualifiers than found in these four phrases. Qad ja'ani. It has come to me. So I did not attain or acquire this knowledge. Allah blessed me by exposing me to it. And in the case of the prophets, that means direct divine revelation. قَدْ جَاءَنِي مِنَ الْعِلْمِ Some of that which is of knowledge. Not all of knowledge. He didn't say to his father, you're a complete fool and I know everything now. So listen to me. Which is what a lot of kids do with their parents, even though they have no divine revelation. All right, min al-ilmi, some of that knowledge that you have not been exposed to. So it's not because I'm more capable than you. Allah exposed me through direct revelation to some ilm, to some knowledge that happened to not come to you. Then comes, do not mistake these qualifiers for a lack of confidence in the message. So follow me and I will guide you to a straight path, a complete and balanced path. Sawi means without fault or defect, that the path is one. So I expose the faults of your path in the first sentence, shook your confidence in that which you thought was, was true in the first sentence. Second sentence, this is a fully bulletproof path. This is a path that is flawless that is without defect, that is without some of the problems that I've mentioned to you in your current belief system. فَاتَّبِعْنِي أَهْدِكَ سِرَاطًا سَوِيَّا يَا أَبَتِي لَا تَعْبُدِ الشَّيْطَانِ إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ كَانَ لِلرَّحْمَانِ عَصِيَّا Oh my dear father, don't worship the shaytan. Verily the shaytan is ever disobedient to his Lord. SubhanAllah, he ascribed the disobedience not to his father but to the shaytan. That it's the shaytan that's disobedient to his Lord. He didn't call his father Asi. Do not follow the shaytan because the shaytan is ever disobedient to his Lord. Ya abati, O my dear father, inni akhafu an yamasaka adabun min al Rahman, fatakuna lil shaytani waliya. O my dear father, I'm afraid, I'm afraid for you. This is not because I enjoy preaching to you. This is not because Allah gave a son something to one-up his father. This is not because 
I enjoy being the spokesperson for truth, what is a clear and manifest truth to a person that's upon falsehood. And usually throughout my life, you were the one dictating terms to me and talking to me. This is because I'm concerned about you. This is because I love you. This is because I do not want you to face the burden. And it's very beautiful how he even removes his father, just as he removed his father from the disobedience, he removes his father from the consequence of the disobedience, while still making clear what consequences of disobedience actually are. So don't worship the shaitan because the shaitan is ever disobedient to his Lord. And then the next ayah, verily, uh, if you were, or I'm afraid that you become a companion to the shaitan because we know where the shaitan is going to be. So I fear that if you follow in his path of disobedience, you face his consequence of disobedience. It's really beautiful. He removed his father from the disobedience, attributing the disobedience directly to him while still making clear that it is an act of disobedience. And he removed his father from the consequence of that disobedience while still making clear what the consequences of that disobedience were. All of that was to do what? Was to remove nafs from the equation. Anyone who's a parent knows that the worst truth to hear is the one that comes on the tongue of your child. Like, it's okay if a peer proves me wrong, or if someone else, like a parent, proves me wrong, but it really stings if it's your child that says something, and you know at some point that they're telling the truth, and, and those of you that are children, don't get ahead of yourselves, you're rarely right. But sometimes, sometimes, you might be right, and it stings because it's, I used to change your diapers. Who are you to tell me about my worldview? I brought you into this world. It's difficult. Ibrahim Islam was removing nafs from the equation. What happened? His father still responded with nothing but ego, which means that at the end of it all, innama alayka al upon you is to deliver the message purely and beautifully. Deliver the truth in a truthful manner. Deliver the pristine, beautiful message of Islam with a beautiful methodology from the Prophet ﷺ. The result of actually reaching that person's heart, that's not in your control. And sometimes, by the way, we make bad decisions and we start to alter the message of Islam because we're afraid that it will not persist. Islam does not depend on you or me. Allah will preserve this deen, whether it's through us or without us. Islam doesn't depend on us to where we need to alter it in order to maintain its survival. We are tasked with conveying it and seeking to convey it with as much diligence and zeal as possible and reassessing our methods of how we convey it as much as we can as if we're responsible for it, but knowing ultimately that we are not. We are not tasked with the actual survival. Allah has taken that upon Himself. So when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inna alayna jama'ahu wa qur'ana, fa'idha qura'nahu, fastam'i qur'ana. Right, so even to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was hearing these messages, the qur'an in, in, in great uh, quantity, it is upon us to preserve the Qur'an. So don't, you know, لا تعجل, don't be hasty with it. Listen to it. It'll come to you. It'll be gathered in your heart, O Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's not the tongue or the memory that's going to keep the Qur'an. It's that Allah has chosen your heart as a capable vessel for it to be gathered in. Likewise, we do our best with the message. We reassess our methods of delivering that message while staying true to it. We try and we try and we try and we try knowing throughout that entire thing, the message doesn't need us. The message doesn't need us because when we start thinking that way, then we start making bad decisions and that's where we may actually start to alter the message rather than our methods for delivering the message because we think that that's the only way for the message to survive. And that's where it becomes, that's the, the fine line where it becomes deeply problematic. The last thing here is the spirit in which we speak to, um, or there are two more slides, what it means to speak to someone with compassion. 
and with the goal of removal of a burden. Number one, understand that the truth is a burden. The truth in its nature is burdensome. Because the truth naturally restricts you in certain ways. It opens pathways, but it restricts you. So you have to understand that when you're speaking to someone and you're preaching orthodoxy or you're trying to impart the message of Islam, you are burdening them by the nature of the message. No one says it's going to be easy. No one says it's going to be easy. So the question that you have to answer for yourself and you have to be able to convey is, well, why do you want to burden the people? <laughs> is the burden that you're placing upon them out of cruelty towards them or out of a desire to see them restricted or because you believe that Islam in its nature is punishing and restricting? SubhanAllah, one of the most beautiful things, you know, when you, when you read the statement of Rabi ibn Amr, may Allah be pleased with him, Rabi who said, that Allah has sent us that Allah has sent us to take people from being enslaved to, all, to other slaves to being enslaved to the Lord of all slaves. And he mentions Islam from the injustice of other systems to the justice of Islam. That last one's very powerful. وَمَنْ ضِيقِ الدُّنْيَا إِلَى سَاعَةِ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ To remove, take them out of the constriction of this world, the suffocation of this world, to the expanse of this life and the next. Meaning, the burden that you bring to them is not really a burden once they understand that it is actually expanding their hearts. It is actually expanding their reward. It is actually an opening for them rather than doors shutting. Islam cannot, we cannot resort to orthodoxy or reference orthodoxy only when we speak in the context of restriction. And this is by the way, you know, Sister Tasneem, mashallah, hit on a lot of thought-provoking points. And one of them, I mean, in, in, instead of just talking about the way that the British uh, system, this uh, the, what, what appeared to be a superior system of Western liberalism, was able to prey on the insecurities of the Muslims that existed at the time and were living with the implications until now. Sometimes, sometimes in our situation as well, we feel like our Islam is so threatened and we start to use terms that other people use with the same meanings that they have. So conservative means harsh. Lenient means liberal. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. Conservative, when you think conservative, what are you programmed to think of? You're programmed to think of callousness. You're programmed to think of conservative as harsh, cruel, tone deaf. And then we use those same terms when we're talking about the deen. And that's the problem. Islam does not bring a burden to people. Islam brings opening to people. So yes, while it brings discipline, discipline does not necessarily mean restriction of purpose or reward. Discipline means that you have to take certain measures in order to realize true liberation. And you have to deliver it to the people in that way. Islam cannot be delivered to people as a burden. And subhanAllah, there was one statement that one of the salaf uh, you know, correlates between da'wah and khidmah. That you cannot do da'wah to the people unless you do khidmah to them. You can't call the people to Islam unless you serve the people in Islam. You can't call the people to Allah unless you serve the people for Allah. Why? Because the place in which your da'wah to them should operate should be from the same place that your khidmah to them operates. What does that mean? When you serve the people, you demonstrate in sincerity that you have their best interests at heart and that you're willing to make sacrifices of your own time, your own effort, your own resources for their goodness. You demonstrate a track record of wanting good for them and in the process, you curtail your own ego. Then when you come to call them to Allah, you call them to Allah in the spirit of wanting to serve their interests in the hereafter. And because the khidmah correlates with the da'wah, the service in the dunyawi sense, in the worldly sense, correlates with the da'wah, the call which is naturally angle towards the hereafter, you demonstrate a consistency that you're operating from the same place. 
So when the Prophet ﷺ calls the people to Allah, he already has years to say, I care about you, I served you for Allah, and I will continue to serve you for Allah. But while I serve you for Allah, in trying to make this world a better place for you, I call you to Allah in trying to make the hereafter a better place for you too. And it's for your own good. It's a concern for you, not for myself. If that compassion is lacking in the message, if you cannot even show people that you care about their worldly being, how is it that you want them to put their faith in what you're calling them to in the hereafter? You don't even care if I can eat or drink here. Or if I have shelter here, if my bills are being paid here, if I have emotional well-being here. Why in the world should I believe when you call me to this heaven and hereafter that you're sincere if you don't care if I'm living in hell on earth? Why should I take you seriously in your da'wah? So I was listening to Robert Jeffress and sometimes, unfortunately, as conservative Muslims, we sound exactly like our conservative Texas Christian brethren. And the only thing that I was listening, Robert Jeffers, for those of you that don't know, he's a pastor out of Dallas and he's Trump's pastor. He's always the guy that goes on Fox News and gives Trump uh, his cover. And when they had March for Our Lives because of gun violence, uh, you know, and, and against gun violence, he instead put up a sign, a billboard in Dallas. He has a huge church called, We're going to do a March for Our Eternal Lives. Kalimatu haq. What do you do we have about it? Like, you know what? Who cares about this life? Let's march for our eternal lives, people. Let's go do a march. To it's like, are you that deaf? So you don't care about their actual lives here, but you expect them to care about the lives that they still don't even know for sure exist in the hereafter? And the only thing he has to say about borders and border walls? Well, there are border walls in heaven. That's what he said. That was his answer. There, so you know where Trump's getting it from, right? <laughs> the wrong fatwa shopping. We got to get him some new people to fatwa shop from. So there are border walls in heaven. So, But you know, sometimes we talk like that too, by the way. Just not with that absurdity, but with the same spirit of just tone deafness. I don't care about you here. Why should, I, why should you think I care about you there? Right? So you have to demonstrate with that orthodoxy, at that point, it doesn't matter what you're giving to them. Once you've demonstrated that you want good for them, they'll consider it. When you know that someone loves you and cares about you, isn't concerned about you, even if what they initially say to you seems preposterous at its initial suggestion, if they've already demonstrated the goodwill, your ego has been disarmed. Your apprehension will be temporary. And you'll say, okay, well, tell me about it. Let me listen to you. Because you've already shown me that you care about me and that you want good for me. That's important. Um, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu has a very beautiful statement, um, which he says he was asked about the best scholar. Dr. Nazar went over what makes a scholar qualified. Sometimes a scholar can be qualified, but not necessarily the best at uh, delivering that knowledge or in messaging, right? And he said that the best faqih is the one who does not make you despair from the mercy of Allah while at the same time not giving you concession to disobey Allah. So beautiful. Say it again. The best scholar is the one who does not cause you to despair from the mercy of Allah while in the process he does not give you concession to disobey Allah. Do you guys get that? Or do I need to say it a third time? Say it one more time. The best scholar is the one that does not cause you to despair from the mercy of Allah while at the same time not giving you concession to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm not going to repeat it a fourth time. You can watch the recording will be up on Yaqeen's website inshallah ta'ala. Uh, a statement between Ibn Zubair and Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with them both. Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, may Allah be pleased with them both and their fathers, they disputed about the methods of delivering that message. And Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu is generally associated with a sense of leniency in fiqh, in jurisprudence. And this was a man who the Prophet sallallahu you know, made dua for himself. Like think about who we're dealing with. We're talking about Ibn Zubair who's the Prophet sallallahu 
uh, you know, prayed for. He mixed his saliva with his saliva when he was born, the first child born in Medina. And Ibn Abbas, عنه, who the Prophet وسلم, held and said, Allahumma faqihu fi deen wa allimhu ta'weel. Oh Allah, grant him a great, great understanding of this deen and teach him proper extrapolation and interpretation. Which one of these guys is going to be wrong? But Ibn Zubair questioned Ibn Abbas's methods. And that's okay. They argued about what the best way to preserve the deen was. The point being, however, Ibn Abbas, do you think Ibn Abbas ever made things easy because he wanted to water down the deen? No, but people would accuse him of watering down the deen. Do you think that Ibn Zubair acted a little harsher because he wanted to run people away from the deen? No, but people accused him of that. The message that we take from this is that they were both operating out of a desire to ultimately see the deen thrive and succeed. And so we have to be willing to reconsider, reassess our methods of how we deliver that message. There's mercy in that diversity too, not just in opinions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us area to, uh, to, to represent. And what it means to represent Allah, recognize that, you know, they say naqlul fatwa fatwa in fiqh, to transfer a fatwa, a ruling, is like giving the ruling itself. Allah gives you the ability to teach someone else, they are hostage to the way that you're explaining Allah to them and the message of Allah to them. What that means as a representative of God in that state is that you do not have Allah's authority, but you must speak truthfully to the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala conveyed the message through the Prophet to us. And it's important to keep that in mind as you're speaking to someone. The last thing is this, what does it mean to listen to someone in pain? Most of the reasons why people end up with faith crisis is because of something that's deeply personal to them. Some form of trauma, some form of grief that rocked their world and the intellectual was not immune to that rocking of their world. And a lot of times it takes for you to just listen to the pain of that person, listen to them talk about why they're having these issues as opposed to just treating the issue at face value. And that's usually the best favor that you can do to a person. Alhamdulillah, Yaqeen, we've had two sisters, mashallah, that are both licensed therapists and also well-grounded students of knowledge that have been working for almost an entire year now. Actually, it marks an entire year on a, on, on a whole collection, a whole series on understanding the relationship between faith and trauma. And every month we're releasing a chapter and we're gonna treat that with infographics and videos and curriculum so people can try to make sense of the connections, those deep connections between what we experience and how our worldviews are going to be shaped in accordance with that experience. So I just leave you with this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Very famous narration, but it can teach you, it teach us, myself, all of us, about how to be sensible and how we convey the message of the Prophet ﷺ. A young man comes to the Prophet ﷺ as he's sitting in the masjid amongst his companions, and he says to the Prophet ﷺ, give me permission to commit fornication. Give me permission to commit zina. Imagine how disrespectful that is. Imagine if you're Abu Bakr or Umar who puts the Prophet ﷺ, rightfully so on such a pedestal, understands the maqam, the status of the Prophet ﷺ, what that does to you, to hear someone approach him in that way, young man and say, give me permission to commit zina. Let's go through what the Prophet ﷺ does. Number one, approachability. There's something to be said that the Prophet ﷺ created a culture to where that young man knew that he could go to the Prophet ﷺ, speak to him, and not be admonished for doing so. That he knew that out of everyone in the masjid, I could go straight to the head, straight to the one to whom divine revelation comes, ask him a question like that, approach him with something like that, and he will not condemn me. Approachability is the first thing. How approachable are you? If your children are not talking to you about their issues, it's not because those issues are not there. If your community members are not talking to you about those issues, it's not because they're not there. It's because there has not been sufficient efforts or attempts given to creating an aura of approachability. Ask, I'm here for you. Ask, I'm here for you. The Prophet ﷺ created that with his body language, with his words, with the, with, with the environment that he established in Al-Madinah Al-Munawwara. The second thing is the Prophet ﷺ paid attention to him. 
The prophet Sallallahu did not roll his eyes or mock him or laugh. You know how bad it is? Let me tell you something that you should never do, by the way, because it might happen in the Q&A right now. Someone asks a question and everyone laughs. A young person musters up the courage to ask a difficult question and people mock that person. Sometimes it happens online too, right? Someone asks a question and they, they have to bring themselves. They cared enough to ask that question and people like laugh at it or the speaker makes fun of them. And may Allah forgive me because I know I've done that before too. So may Allah forgive us all. It hurts someone when they muster up the courage to tell you something like that and you mock them with your expression. The Prophet ﷺ paid attention to him. He didn't laugh, he didn't scoff, he didn't, oh God, just someone go handle this boy. He listened, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The third thing, compassion, which is conveyed from the start to the finish of this interaction. The fourth thing, the Prophet ﷺ did not minimize the issue. When someone comes to you with an issue and says that they have a problem, don't put down their problem. It's very interesting that the Prophet ﷺ taught us as a coping mechanism. It's healthy for us that when we don't have much, we look to those who have less. Or when we're going through a problem, we do look to those that have bigger problems. For ourselves, when we have that ability to do so. But don't tell someone else your issue is insignificant or not important. Like, listen to me, young man. You want to commit zina? Look at that guy over there who's sitting in the corner of the masjid. He's 45 years old. He never asked me for permission to commit zina. He didn't do that, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. There were companions like that, by the way, that were a lot older than the young man that had never gotten married, were unable to get married or to find legal ways of dealing with that shahwa. But the Prophet ﷺ did not minimize his issue. The Prophet ﷺ explained the ruling at his level. The Prophet ﷺ said to him, listen to me, O young man. He said, would you, would you like for someone to do so with your mother? He said, no. He said, with your sister? He said, no. He said, Kadalik and Nas. He said, people are like that too. Now, someone might look at that and be really offended. Right? Like, what an example. You know what? It was a culturally appropriate example. And it was an example that would resonate with that young man. The Prophet ﷺ spoke to him at his level. Speak to people with things that, they will, that, that will resonate with them and speak to them at their intellectual level. You don't have to use that. So your son comes home and asks you for permission and you respond with that and it totally blows up in your face. That's not the point here. The point is the Prophet ﷺ reasoned with him. He came down to his level ﷺ. Lastly, the Prophet ﷺ made dua for him. He prayed for him. At the end of this interaction, the Prophet ﷺ was not satisfied with having satisfied the question. He reaffirmed that this was for his own interest by putting his hand on the young man's chest and making dua for him. And subhanAllah, that young man felt the impact of the dua of the Prophet ﷺ and his hand on his chest. At no point did the Prophet ﷺ change the ruling of zina. At no point did the Prophet ﷺ compromise his own self-respect. At no point did the Prophet ﷺ compromise the integrity of the message. At no point did the Prophet ﷺ minimize the crime of zina. All of that while in that interaction, helping that young man rise above, not the desire, not the desire, but what he was seeking to do or what he was looking for, the permission that he was seeking to act in that desire in an inappropriate way. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us that same compassion, that same love, that same ability, that rahmah, to make us firm upon the truth ourselves and to make us able conveyors of the truth as well. Allahumma ameen. Jazakallah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.